The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christie's.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime. Hello, it's The Week in Art. I'm Ben Luke. This week, the extraordinary story behind the biggest art fraud in history in Canada. A new report on the scandalously low fees paid to artists and The Ugly Duchess by Quentin Massey in London. As a thousand fake works by the First Nations artist Norval Morisot are seized by Canadian police and eight people are charged, the art newspaper's editor in the Americas, Ben Sutton, tells the extraordinary story involving a rock star, a television documentary and alleged forgery rings and what it tells us about the market for First Nations art in Canada. A report into artists' pay in the UK has exposed the pitifully low sums paid to artists for their labour by arts organisations. I talked to the art collective Industria, who wrote the report, and Julie Lomax, the CEO of AN, the artist's information company, which has published the study. And this episode's work of the week is An Old Woman by the Northern Renaissance artist Quentin Massai, a painting better known as The Ugly Duchess. A new exhibition at the National Gallery in London focuses on this work in its collection, exploring its origins in a drawing by Leonardo da Vinci and the combination of satire, folklore, humanism and misogyny from which it emerged. Emma Capron, the curator of the show, tells us more. Don't forget, you can subscribe to the art newspaper by visiting our website and clicking the subscribe link at the top left of the homepage. You can choose from digital, complete or student subscription. Do also subscribe to this podcast wherever you're listening and to our sister podcast, A Brush With, and leave us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. Now, last week, the Ontario Provincial Police in Canada announced their investigation into a criminal ring forging works by the renowned Ojibwe artist Norval Morisot had uncovered the biggest art fraud in world history. The case resulted in charges against eight people and the seizure of more than a thousand paintings. The forgery ring allegedly also exploited young Indigenous artists, underlining larger national issues about Canada's treatment of First Nations people. I spoke to Ben Sutton, our America's editor, about the story. Ben, we're going to be talking about Norval Morisot. Tell us about him, because he's enormously famous in Canada, but less so outside of Canada, I guess. So Morisot is one of Canada's most celebrated artists of the past century. You know, his work is on stance in Canada. It's in the collections of most major museums there, including the Art Gallery of Ontario, the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, the National Gallery in Ottawa. He was born in 1932 in rural part of northwestern Ontario, and what he's most significant for in Canadian modern art history is being the founder and pioneer of the Woodlands style or the Woodlands school of art, which is this genre of painting that's kind of practiced primarily in the Great Lakes region, sort of in the center of the continent, and it draws on indigenous cosmology and oral histories and also kind of synthesizes some elements of Western modernism. It's kind of a a genre that typically involves kind of stylized human or animal figures rendered with, you know, thick outlines and really bright, vibrant colors. And he had a a breakout show in 1962 at the Pollock Gallery in Toronto, and that really sort of catapulted him to to national and international fame. He was a famously met Marc Chagall once in Paris and was dubbed the Picasso of the North. Yeah, that's an extraordinary fact, isn't it? In fact, this whole story is laced with extraordinary (laughs) facts, but that's one of them. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So he just has this kind of outsized presence in, in the Canadian art world, and but somehow is not quite as renowned beyond, uh, despite having had this really kind of illustrious career. Absolutely. And in, in a way, one of the sort of debates around this whole story that we're going to talk about is what effect it's having on his reputation. Because on the one hand, people like me are talking about him for the first time but also at the same time it relates to forgeries of his work and therefore his market is damaged so it's a curious story in that sense isn't it yeah yeah absolutely it's somebody who's sort of going on a a kind of wider radar for kind of undesirable reasons I suppose So let's talk about it then. I mean, again, this has its origins in an unlikely source in the sense that it relates first to a painting that was sold to the keyboard player of the band Bare Naked Ladies. Tell us about that. That's right. You know, he died in 2007. um, And even before his death, he was aware that, you know, this was going to be an issue, that there were fakes in the market kind of diluting the, uh, the value of his work. But that didn't really become 
more widely known and a kind of broader narrative until uh, this documentary came out in 2019 called There Are No Fakes. This is a documentary by Jamie Kastner. Um, and it follows, as you said, the experience of Kevin Hearn, the uh, the keyboardist from the beloved Canadian band, the Bare Naked Ladies. <laughs> and he had bought a Morisot painting for 20000 Canadian dollars. And when he went to lend it for an exhibition, the curator of the show said, well, wait a minute, I'm not sure this is real. And that kind of sends her and, and Kastner following him down this rabbit hole, trying to get his money back, but also trying to unravel this forgery ring that produced his painting. And in the process of that, it emerges that there may be as many as 3,000 fake Morisot works kind of out in the world. And so ever since then, it's been kind of a, a topic of of much concern within the Canadian art community. Uh, Morisot's estate has like an authentication service that it offers through its website. Um, so it's clearly kind of trying to get get out ahead of this massive pool of fakes. And so the most recent news is that the uh, the Ontario Provincial Police busted a forgery ring uh, at the beginning of the month and seized more than a thousand forged more so it works which is just a sort of inconceivable number of fakes to be circulating exactly and if you watch the police press conference online and you can find it on youtube if you're interested listeners there's a point where one of the officers points out that you know there's there's this number of paintings that we've got on the stage behind me imagine that there's a hundred for every single one of these which we've seized the scale of it is phenomenal isn't it yeah absolutely and that's why yeah they, they sort of dubbed it the biggest art fraud in world history which Sounds hyperbolic, but when you consider again the, just the number of works, and you know his his art, you know, is not selling for millions of dollars, but his his auction record, which was set just last year, is currently about three hundred twelve thousand Canadian dollars, which works out to about two hundred forty U.S. dollars. So not nothing if you you know start multiplying that by a thousand or three thousand. Um, it's a it's a huge huge market. And the curious thing is that by all accounts, identifying the fakes from the originals is actually quite an easy process in many cases, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they're, they're fairly clear signals in, in a lot of the fake works, mostly revolving around the way they've been signed. You know, he was a member of the Ojibwe First Nation band known as the Bingwe Neashi Anishinaabek, uh, and he, at a certain point in his career, started adopting a very specific pictographic way of signing his work, and so that is usually a pretty clear indicator that a work is authentic. But a lot of the works that have been seized in this forgery ring and in past busts have featured kind of fairly rudimentary and crude signatures with his initials or his name in a very kind of clear, too clear manner. And so, Absolutely. yeah, and English signatures on the back of the paintings rather than Cree signatures on the front, basically. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And it's curious, isn't it, that also that it seems to relate to a particular period of his work. Is that right? So that there's a sort of a period between 1955 and 1985 that's now the subject of an actual, you know, kind of art historical study. And it seems that this is sort of vital in clearing it up because works of that period are the ones that are sort of particularly seized upon by the fakers, as it were. Yeah, well, I think that's a period where he was sort of still ascendant and there's there's room to kind of fill in perceived gaps in the, in the provenance and in the research. And also that's when uh, he's having his sort of largest influence really in, in the Canadian art world. That's sort of when the Will in the School of Art rises to prominence. That's when he also in the, I believe it was in the mid 70s, co-founded a group known as the, the Indigenous Group of Seven, which was kind of this reclaiming of Canadian iconography from the famous Canadian landscape painting tradition group of seven. So it, it really is kind of the core of his of um, that era. And so I think that's that's part of why you see the forgers really focusing on that period. There's a lot about this story that's sort of in some ways titillating and, and exciting and, you know, almost movie worthy. Yeah. But also it does speak to much darker issues, doesn't it, about, for instance, exploitation of indigenous communities and so on. Yeah. And this is not an isolated case not only for Morisot's work but for indigenous artists work in general in Canada you know in the United States we have this act that was passed in 1990 called the United States Indian Arts and Crafts Act um, which basically criminalizes making or marketing artworks that were not made by indigenous people as art made by indigenous people it's it's punishable by fines and by prison time and there's a portal on the U.S. Department of the Interior where you can report possible fakes. And there, there's really no protection like that in Canada. And there's been a lot of agitation over the past decade or so, especially from the indigenous artists saying, you know, like not only are there people within Canada making works that aren't 
by indigenous artists and selling them as such. But there's a whole kind of import business as well of works that are made overseas and brought into Canada to be sold in, in tourist shops and less scrupulous galleries. And there needs to be more legislation and more regulation of all these things. And so it's it's really kind of become part of this like larger debate that's happening in Canada. And that's been happening in Canada for the past decade around indigenous rights and also indigenous intellectual property rights and then kind of enforcing those. Well, there's actually a, um, a Canadian senator, Patricia Bovey, who's who's also a former art historian, who's kind of advocating for a, a federal level equivalent to this this U.S. Indian Arts and Crafts Act, something that can not only sort of empower artists to go after people who are making fraudulent works, but also support them financially. Because you know, part of the problem is not only identifying fake works, but then having the resources to sue someone or or you know pursue them in some in some manner. So there's definitely the beginnings of movement, but it's such a huge problem and there's so many federal, local, provincial authorities that would need to be involved. I think it's going to take a while for something similar to what we have in the US to be put in place, but that definitely seems like what's what's needed. Does the fact that this particular case relates to such a prominent artist mean that there may be extra focus on that from a political perspective? Yeah, I would think so. I mean, it, you know, when you have the, the biggest art fraud in history, that certainly raises eyebrows and concerns and also just the, the exorbitant sums and numbers of paintings, I would think is going gonna, is gonna to put this on the radars of a lot of people for whom it might have not been such a consideration before. You know, one of the pride of Canadian contemporary art being subject to, to this kind of forgery scheme should, I, I would think, make it a more more immediate imperative. Let's talk about what we know in terms of the charges then. So we should say it's only charges at this point. Nobody's been convicted, but basically it's, it involves eight people. Is that right? That's right. So there's eight men, most of whom were arrested in Thunder Bay, which is a community of 1,400 kilometers northwest of Toronto. And so eight men ranging in age from, um, I believe, 47 to 81. One of them is actually, uh, at least one of them is actually a relative of Moriso's. And they've all been, been charged with you know, some combination of attempted fraud and forgery and there's a few other specific charges for some of them. But at this stage, the gallery owners don't seem to be as implicated in the sense that it seems to be much more the people who are making the fakes and then forging the documents around them. Is that right? Yeah, I think so. I think this seems to be very much kind of at the top of the forgery chain and at least thus far not implicating the people who would, who would then be selling the work. So and I'm sure, I mean, this is the result of a multi-year investigation. So I would imagine that there are more charges to come and that this will widen from here. And then just lastly, Norval Morisot, I mentioned at the start, there's this sort of debate about his reputation. It seems to me important, though, that there is now, because of this, a catalogue resume that's being produced. And therefore, that seems to be the sort of thing that will actually generate a much broader awareness of the work and a kind of much more professionalised means of sort of managing the work, as it were. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, yeah, I think that's that's one of the challenges of kind of regulating his market has just been that there's work that's come to market in a pretty piecemeal fashion from various galleries. And his estate, as I mentioned, has a kind of a portal for, for offering authentication services, which is not uh, by no means a given these days. So that's, that's definitely valuable. But I think you're right that having a firm and established catalog resume that can be referred to in doubtful situations is, is going to sort of be a real game changer because... When there are one to several thousand fake works circulating in the market. Ten um, times more yeah, fakes need... than originals, they're saying. Right, right? yeah, exactly. When, when it's a problem of that scale, having, having some kind of source of, of authority is, is pretty essential. So I think there's a lot of hope that that project will help solve this. Well, Ben, thank you so much for telling us about this intriguing story. Yeah, no problem. You can read more about this story at theartnewspaper.com or on our app for iOS and Android. Coming up, a report into artists Pay and the Ugly Duchess at the National Gallery. But first, here's this week's news bulletin. 
The sculptor Phila de Barlow died on Sunday, aged 78. She's one of the most significant British artists of recent decades, developing a distinctive visual language responding to the physical and psychological effects of modern life using humdrum materials like wood, plaster, cement, fabric and paint, fashioned into awkward, raw and imposing objects and structures that stretch the height and width of the spaces in which they were shown. Though admired by artists for decades, she only exhibited widely in the UK and internationally in the past 15 years with key shows at the Serpentine Gallery in London in 2010, the New Museum in New York in 2012, Tate Britain in London in 2014, the Haus der Kunst in Munich in 2021 and perhaps most notably in the British Pavilion at the Venice Biennale in 2017. She was also a revered teacher at the Slade School in London for 40 years. The Centre Pompidou in Paris has signed a deal to develop a museum of contemporary art in the burgeoning Alula region of Saudi Arabia. The new agreement between the Pompidou and the Royal Commission for Alula, the Saudi government cultural body led by the country's de facto ruler, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, was finalised on the 12th of March. The agreement was signed at a ceremony involving Laurent Le Bon, the Centre Pompidou president, Arts Alula executive director Noura Al Dabal, Prince Badir Ben Farhan, the Saudi Minister of Culture, and the French Culture Minister. Minister Rima Abdul Malak. An opening date for the Saudi Museum has not been confirmed. And finally, the Republic of Benin will have a national pavilion at the Venice Biennale for the first time ever next year, joining the small but growing presence of African nations at the world's longest-running contemporary art exhibition. Azu Nwagbogu, founder and director of the Lagos-based non-profit African Artists Foundation, will curate the inaugural display, according to the announcement on Monday, by the government of the West African Republic. You can keep up to date with all the latest news on next year's Biennale and read more on all these stories on the website or the app. We'll be back after this. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. This March, discover the breadth and diversity of British and Irish art in the 20th and 21st centuries, presented across two auctions at Christie's London. Highlights of this season include a unique string sculpture by Barbara Hepworth, a stunning group of works by David Hockney, the only known study of Pauline Boaty's iconic bum painting, examples by neo-romantic artists Keith Vaughan and Graham Sutherland, and an important collection of vorticist artworks by Wyndham Lewis, David Bomberg, John Duncan Ferguson and more. Visit Christie's Galleries on 8 King Street, St James's in London and explore the pre-sale exhibition until the 21st of March. Entry is free and open to all. Discover all this and more at christies.com. Welcome back. Now, a report published this week lays bare the scale to which artists are being underpaid or sometimes even unpaid for their work by arts institutions in the UK. The report was published by AN, the artist's information company, the largest artist membership organisation in the UK and authored by the two-person artist collective Industria. It's based on a survey conducted by Industria after the two submitted a freedom of information request to Tate, asking for information on their pay structures for artists. Tate responded that it was not in their, quote, commercial interest to provide this information. Industrious survey, which they call Artist Leaks, was an attempt to uncover this information directly from artists themselves. It was launched via an open call for artists to anonymously share their experiences of paying conditions in UK publicly funded institutions and visual arts programmes. The report is called, forgive the swear word, Structurally Fucked, a phrase taken from one of the many artist testimonies that punctuate the report. The full quote is as follows. The pressure to make things work and to be grateful and positive can really break you. They never factor in reflection, rest and the expectation to over deliver is unspoken and loud. Everybody over commits and as the artist you're at the bottom of the food chain and expected to do your magic in a system that is structurally fucked. I spoke to Industria who've asked to remain anonymous and to Julie Lomax, CEO of AN. Industria, you put together this survey but I just wanted to go backwards a bit and just talk about the last report that we talked about actually on this podcast which was the Arts Council England report which I know in in your report you say there are some issues with but basically there were some statistics in there that were pretty damning. To what extent was that a sort of background for your report? Were the findings in there significant to how you approach things? So I think we found it really useful background in terms of it being a report that came out sort of a decade on from the financial crisis. So sort of already a lot of years into austerity at that point. So it was already a kind of record of artists under those conditions. And yeah, it was a good kind of representation of 
artist livelihoods, the jobs that artists do alongside to maintain their practice and how much artists rely on, on other sources of income. But yeah, we didn't rely on it too much. It was sort of a, a bit of background. And I know Julie wanted to come in as well and sort of talk about the relevance of that to AN's research. Julie. Yes, yeah, so AM was commissioned to lead that report. It's the Livelihoods of Visual Artists. It was actually published in 2018, but most of the data actually relates to 2015. And interestingly, if you look at the real headline in there, is the majority of artists at that point in 2015, and this was like the median income was uh, £6,000 that they were making per annum, from their actual practice. So whilst it covers lots of other, it's a very, very long and in-depth report with many different sections to it. I mean, that's really the headline and you can actually find that report on AN's website. Right. Industria, you also wanted to establish a context or a background to your report, which was in relation to this balance between public and commercial funding in public institutions. So, for instance, there are exhibitions that we will see in major public institutions, and you'll see that a commercial gallery has helped fund that show. And that's something that you established in the introduction to your report, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. So we're very clear in our report that we are focusing specifically on public funding, but we do draw attention to the fact that these waters between public and private funding are very muddied um, and have become increasingly muddied over the last sort of few years. We draw attention as well to the fact that, as you say, when you have public institutions saying that particular shows are funded by private funding as well, that we see this as like the private sphere plugging gaps in public funding. And what this leads to is a like less risk taking happening in public institutions because they need these public galleries or private patronages to be plugging these gaps. So you, you lead to a space where public institutions are taking on artists who have gallery representation or private representation to plug these gaps. That's interesting. And then, of course, there is just a public funding crisis in general, isn't there? And you allude to that in the report. Yeah, absolutely. It's very clear that, you know, this is a huge structural issue. So... I think there was some kind of hesitancy maybe from institutions that we were specifically saying that, um, you know, smaller spaces kind of bear all of the responsibility for paying their artists properly, but obviously it comes right from the top. So it's the money that ACE and DCMS have and how they pass all that out to institutions is a huge problem. But at the same time, it feels like there's been very little resistance to that kind of austerity politics that we absolutely see the funding crisis as part of from um, directors of institutions and those who are kind of holding the reins of the funding and parceling out those cuts to lowest paid workers, to artists. So, yeah, it's it's right from the very top and it's hugely structural. So we don't for one minute think that the report is going to immediately make directors wake up and say, oh, we've been treating artists and also our lower paid workers really badly. Let's immediately change that. It's a huge structural problem that's going to take a lot of a lot of gears moving in a lot of different places to actually actually make change. But I just wanted to go back a little bit to the muddying of public and commercial funding and also the public funding crisis, because when I say there's a little bit of history to this, really the history goes back hundreds of years. And, you know, the visual arts actually is built on a patronage and a market model. And even some of our major museums were founded and the initial collections were collections of private individuals. So there's something there in the DNA of our public institutions, which, you know, you can kind of trace it right back to the Renaissance and probably before that. And what happens and what's happened for many hundreds of years is this idea of the object being traded. So the artwork is traded uh, rather than, you know, any kind of thinking about the artist. And I think that bit of the DNA in the sector is quite hard to change, but I do think it can change. And I heard it recently described as well around the muddying of public and commercial funding in institutions as being an insider trading and at worst, a Ponzi scheme. That's quite confronting language, really. And then 
because of course as well there's been this explosion of artistic practice from the 60s and 70s that dna in institutions around the thinking about the objects you know it hasn't changed and those are the things that we aim to change and our advocacy so following from this uh, report we're actually going to be releasing a code of practice uh, working with organizations on that code of practice but also um, an artist payment guide and the exhibition payment guide and one of the big pieces of advocacy we want to do over the next two years is to get exhibition payments so the idea that when an artist shows the work, not the bit before when they're making the work or when they install the work or when they deinstall the work, but the bit when the work is actually shown, that that goes into a copyright law and those payments are actually part of copyright. And this is very true because of other systems like France um, and other countries where exhibition payments are part of copyright law. So we will be working with DAX to actually take that forward. Right. So yes, we will be doing lots of advocacy and lots of working with organisations and artists over the next two years. Okay. Industria, the survey that you did, it was done on Instagram, is that right? And that's obviously a space where lots of artists are in discussion anyway. Yes, we did publicise it mostly on Instagram and then also through our other channels such as MailOuts and we contacted like-minded institutions and organisations to promote it as well. And there are 18 questions in the survey. Can you give us a sense of the kind of questions that you asked? Yeah, so we sort of took a bit of time to shape the survey questions and actually in its very early days, which we we actually started it during the initial stages of the COVID lockdown. That was what we were doing with our with our time on furlough from our other jobs. But um, yeah, we we got some advice from artists who've been working a lot longer than we have to shape the questions. So the main shape of the survey stayed the same, but they were able to add in more specific questions about production budgets and what those entailed. But, you know, between us, we've had some experience of working with institutions, but not at the same level. So it was really good to be able to have um, the expertise of artists who've been working longer than we had to kind of add more detail and add more breadth to it as well. So the main things that we asked and we also kind of left it open to people to be able to say as much as they were comfortable saying because we're aware that it's a quite a big ask and makes people feel quite vulnerable actually to disclose the level of information that they could be identified by the institution that they'd worked with technically from the information so we left it open to how much detail they gave us but the main thing we asked was either the sort of location and scale of the institution or the name of the institution or commissioner that they'd worked with, they could choose to divulge either of those. And then we asked about the scope and scale of the project, the production budget, whether they felt that they had been fairly paid, and that kind of had three stages. So in relation to other people working on the project, so kind of draw out that question in relation to the people they were working with as well. So yeah, it it was really designed to kind of get a flavour of of how they felt in terms of the sort of statistics around the project. But also what really surprised us was that we put a comments box that we were kind of expecting would just fill in the gaps of what we might have left out in the more prosaic questions. But actually it became a real sort of outpouring of distress, frustration, all the sort of things that you can't record in numbers kind of came pouring out in that section. And we sort of came to realise that that was actually just as valuable as the kind of cold hard data that we got through it, the distress that that being underpaid causes and the kind of disrespect that breeds really. And those quotes all the way through the report are really quite extraordinary, aren't they? And in fact, it seems to me that you sort of double down to a certain degree on the qualitative data that you're talking about with these focus groups, Julie, so that you with Industria held focus groups where you talk to artists in more depth about these issues that they were encountering. Yeah, so I found Industria on Instagram and um, AN's work has always really been about... um, artists, livelihoods, and really incorporating, you know, grassroots activism in our work. As I said, I found them on uh, Instagram, and we were just about to start work on renewing all of our paying artists campaign, our payment guides, and also our tools for artists to use, such as sample contracts, etc. And so I invited uh, Industria to take part in that work. And so we held a number of focus groups last year 
and the focus groups were grouped around artists, but also we held focus groups with people who were also presenting art, so institutions, commissioners, curators, independent producers, and um, Industria followed that process um, through with AN last year. And all of that work has actually then fed into the next stage of this, so not just the report, but the next stage of AN's paying artists' work. And Industria, what kind of conclusions did you reach from these kind of processes? Because one of the things that strikes me is really crucial is that organisations are paying lump sums, which might look a large amount, for instance. But ultimately, when you reduce that to an hourly pay, artists are being paid a pittance. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that was the first thing that, when looking at the data, stood out to us immediately that there was so much being obscured in these lump sums. So by working these out, so dividing these into hourly rates to basically put them alongside other workers' struggles and put them into context with minimum hourly rates, the picture was a lot more clear of what was going on here. And returning as well back to what Julie's talking about with the AN focus groups, this is something that like really rang true with everyone we were talking to there this thing of how much the lump sum obscures. And I think that was one of the main takeaway conclusions of the report. And also one of the biggest suggestions going forward is that we need to be really breaking these down and actually seeing how much people are getting paid for their time when it goes into daily and hourly rates. And there's this other thing that talks and workshops, which are actually obviously a much more visible evidence of the artist working on an hourly or daily basis, were much better paid in comparison to the kind of act of making. Yeah, completely. And I think that really sort of comes back to what Julie was saying about the separation between the art object and the actual act of making, that sort of rhetorical separation that's really carried through, right through histories of art, sort of really bears out in that fact. There's a, there's a real emphasis on the product, but not how the product comes to be. So that seems to us a huge part of the reason why exhibition making is so poorly paid. Production budgets might be huge to get objects to come into existence, but yeah, an artist's pay might actually be sort of 2 to 5% of that overall production budget, which is really small. Absolutely. And just to give a flavour of, of what I was talking about in terms of the low pay, in some cases, there's somebody making work for a major organisation and they were paid, you worked out £1.56 an hour. You know, this isn't just like a one-off. It seems to me that this is right across the board, right? Yeah, absolutely. We have multiple examples within the report of basically the money is there to make the art, but the money is not there to pay the artist for the labour to make the art. So exactly this kind of like, you know, a couple of percent of the entire overall budget is going towards an artist's fee, whereas the money is there for creating the artwork. Julie, this seems to me to be a sort of consistent thing that organisations still see the prestige of making work for a public space as a form of remuneration, that somehow that is enough as a sort of means of boosting the artist and therefore that the actual fee that is paid to them is less important? Well, I mean, you see many, many opportunities advertised and there's absolutely no fee. It really is about, we're going to give you this opportunity. And of course, opportunities don't really pay the bills. And I think particularly in the public sector, artists do need to be fairly paid because the public sector is there not to be the market. Clearly, we have an art market and if you are in your studio and you make an object and then you've got a commercial gallery and that commercial gallery will sell that art, there's a little bit more transparency in that transaction. But I think what it also comes down to is the, the lack of transparency in transactions and this idea that somehow you would you know, gain this opportunity and perhaps your you know, your work would gain value and um, be endorsed by that institution or wherever you're showing it, because this is also uh, part of other areas of the visual arts sector, such as, you know, prizes and, and all different kinds of areas that, you know, people might actually want to show their art. And so it can be very difficult for organisations as well to actually be able to pay the artists what they are supposed to be paid. And um, that is because, and we've said it before, you know, that there is structural underfunding of the visual arts sector. 
And obviously, we've just talked about those lump sums. But this idea of prestige and opportunity that will build your market for the art, it's very disingenuous because not everybody is going to go into that major art market where clearly, you know, you might make a lot of money. That really is the very sort of 1% level of artists out there, or probably much less than that, I would imagine. Yeah, I think, didn't Jerry Saltz just say the 1% of the 1% in a tweet the other day? Absolutely. Um, Industrial, I wanted to ask about this very important aspect of the report, which is not in the quantitative data so much as the qualitative stuff, which is the fact that low artist pay is actually a structural barrier to a lot of the kind of aims which are much vaunted amongst public institutions in relation to diversity and accessibility. Can you say something about that? I mean, this is one of the main findings that we really want to sort of underline in the report, that paying artists a low fee will basically lead to a homogenous art world. And that unless you have uh, properly remunerated labor, you're only going to have artists who have a financial cushion or some kind of, you know, inherited wealth or wealth through partners or basically some way of staying afloat on fees that are pittance. And, you know, with all of the kind of language and, and aims of so many institutions and the art world in the past few years of diversifying, These are really empty promises if you don't actually have the structural and financial support to help people from other kinds of backgrounds enter the art world. As you say, it's the rhetoric that happens in institutions so much at the moment and the gap between what is actually happening, I think, is incredibly painful for people. And I think that really comes through in the qualitative data. I think that sense of pain at being used to represent your identity in an institution and then actually not having the financial or structural support to make you feel at home within an institution, to make you feel supported, to enable you to make the work that you're being asked to make to represent your identity is a real problem. All of these kind of structural barriers are ways of kind of determining someone's class to an extent. So if you're disabled and you've got additional access needs, your ability to make work within an institution that's not financially supporting you is really hindered. So there's all sorts of ways that, yeah, structural barriers just get perpetuated. Race and class obviously interact hugely. Definitely. And I think there's also like an important thing of it's not just about money, right? It's not, this came through in the testimonies a lot, that sure, the money wasn't there for things like access budgets, which is, you know, unacceptable. But at the same time, it's also the complete like misunderstanding or just no care or acknowledgement of people's differing timetables or availability or capacities and not acknowledging that is incredibly painful alongside the finances not being there to support it. And I think that sort of stems from underpaying people's time within institutions as well. It's sort of below the very top levels, the people that are actually taking care of artists, curators, etc., If they're really stretched and their workloads are huge and they're not actually being paid well enough within within the pay structures within an institution and their ability to actually give the care and attention to people is really limited as well. And that's that's part of the same problem. Julie, you've already suggested earlier on about how you're going to act on the information that you have. Um, It seems to me that one of the key things is that there need to be people within the ranks of directors and leaders of organisations that have to speak up about this, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, One of the things that we are doing next, so we're going to publish a code of practice and obviously what we would like to do and what we need to monitor is behavioural change. So that transformation in the sector. So we're going to wrap around an evaluation around the code of practice and invite organisations to not only adopt the code of practice, but we'll follow them over a two-year period to see how that has actually impacted and changed the way that they work. And also with the other tools and uh, guides that we're going to produce, which are really more transactional, something like an artist's payment fees guide, it's there for artists to use to calculate their fees and to help them work out how much projects, artworks, labour, costs. What we will do as well is follow artists and how they are then actually using those guides and how they found using those guides with organisations, which might not be the same organisations that actually volunteer 
to be in the evaluation around the code of practice. But I think what's going to be interesting about this evaluation and monitoring is it's actually going to tell us that is what we're doing actually successful? And I think that's really important. And I think that's how we create change because, you know, collective responsibility in the sector is a really powerful action. And I really want to encourage, you know, new economies of exchange, which place the artist at the centre and also are transparent around fair pay, care and respect. Absolutely. And in terms of artists in Dustria, you're also suggesting certain things that they can do. Can you give us a flavour of those things? Yeah, so the main thing um, that we suggest is that artists look at their position in relation to one another, in relation to other low-paid workers or uh, precarious workers and do everything that we can collectively to cultivate solidarity. It's obviously not our responsibility to kind of make that change happen. We're already dealing with enough as it is, I think, all of us as artists, especially at the grassroots or kind of that elongated mid-career that most artists go through. So... Yeah, I think really our focus has to be on joining artist unions and making sure we kind of keep up with conversations through new guidance coming out from bodies like AN and really look at what we can do to start questioning how we can kind of resist on our own terms in the interactions that we have with institutions. It's obviously incredibly hard, though, if you individualise it. So, you know, asking individual artists to do the work of when they're involved with a commission or an institution to say, actually, you're not paying me artist union rates or you're not even paying minimum wage. It's really hard. But we do sort of suggest that to kind of get a sense of what pay you are missing out on, even if it's just for yourself and you don't feel comfortable passing it on to the institution is to keep an artist time diary. And that's something that one of the Artist Leaks respondents actually mentioned as well, is that if you kind of map where your time is going, you can then look at what your own hourly rate works out as at the end of a project and work out in relation to the minimum wage or an artist union recommended rate, how much actually went missing in that project and how much you're being underpaid. Yeah. And then you can use that to kind of place yourself within what's going on in the wider sector, or you can actually kind of go back to an institution and say, look, this is what's happened. We're also keeping the Artist Leaks form open and hope that it can like build and remain as a resource for artists to kind of locate their fees and their pay within wider structures. And also we can try and track and see if anything is changing and when whether there has been any impact here. And also another one coming back to what Judy was saying about transparency, we do make the point as well of it not just coming from institutions transparency, of course the lion's share is, but in terms of being an artist, there is this thing I think we're all taught at art school that we're in competition with each other and we kind of perform success and we're not actually honest sort of outwardly about how we're not being paid properly and that these need to become open conversations and we shouldn't be embarrassed about this. This isn't like an individualised problem. Artists are getting underpaid structurally across the board. So linking up these two things of like, Artists need to be honest about what they're being paid and not feel like they need to perform success. And at the same time, institutions need to be honest about what is doable within their ever shrinking budgets. So we've seen over the last decades, cultural funding dwindling, and yet shows don't seem to be getting any less sort of flashy. And we're making the point of, you know, we need to actually be working within our means on both sides here. And that we need to show what less cultural funding does, what the effect is that you don't get as much for your money. World Industria and Judy, thank you all very much for joining me. Thanks so much. Thank you. You can find a PDF of the report at a-n.co.uk and Industria's website is we-industria.org. And finally, it's time for the work of the week. This week, the National Gallery in London opened The Ugly Duchess, Beauty and Satire in the Renaissance, a show looking in depth at one of the most renowned pictures in the gallery's collection, a painting of an old woman made in about 1513 by the Antwerp-based artist Quentin Massai. It's reunited at the National with the pendant painting that Massai intended it to hang next to, an old man. I went to the gallery to take a closer look with Emma Capron, the exhibition's curator. 
Emma, I'd like to begin actually by talking about Leonardo, because one of the things I'd never known, even though I've seen this painting millions of times, it seems, is that actually behind it is a drawing by Leonardo. Tell us the story. So this is one of the momentous reunion that we are so thrilled to achieve in the exhibition is to display for the first time ever the Ugly Duchess with two drawings after Leonardo da Vinci that uh, inspired it. We do not know how Masai got his hands on drawings by Leonardo da Vinci, but his earliest uh, documented work, the Lamentation Altarpiece in Antwerp, already features heads borrowed from Leonardo. So it's fascinating to think that they actually arrived in Antwerp somehow, you know, during Leonardo's lifetime and actually before he's quite the superstar that he becomes towards the end of his life. But however they get there, they do. And Masai is a key figure in their introduction in Antwerp. And he starts plundering them, putting them in his uh, religious positions. And then sometimes, as we can see with the Duchess, really kind of running with it. And in this case, transforming the small, you know, intimate design in a grand, ambitious composition. Before we get on to Masai's actual work, can you say something about the type that depicting an old woman in a satirical manner, as you show here, it's both a kind of folkloric tradition, but also a kind of very much a Renaissance humanist joke? Yes, absolutely. So in the Renaissance, there was this belief that actually is inherited from classical understandings of physiology that women post-menopause were uh, completely incapable of controlling their sexual urges. So So therefore, the lust of older women was a frequent uh, butt of Renaissance jokes indeed. And this is what we see here. We see actually a rare depiction of female desire in uh, Western painting, actually. And it is, in this case, very much uh, derided. So she's wearing a very provocative outfit and seeking to seduce the old man. And it is something we see in literature as well, in humanistic literature. Humanists take aim at older women, and I should say as well, at old men for their lechery, old men who marry uh, young maidens. So it's not just straight misogyny, there's an element of morality involved. Absolutely. I mean, every humanistic uh, satire of this period is really meant to impart a moral lesson, uh, to convey a kind of moralistic message indeed. And it's Erasmus in The Praise of Folly who says, uh, for every reader who's a bit clever, you know, they will see that uh, my praise of folly is not foolish indeed. And that's very much the spirit of both this kind of writings and uh, this kind of paintings. And, and Masai knew Erasmus and depicted him, actually portrayed him twice, right. once in a painting and once in a medal. Right. And t- tell us about his standing then when he made this picture, Masai. So he makes it in the 1510s. We don't know exactly the date. And at this point, he's one of the leading painters in Antwerp, which is no small feat because Antwerp at this point is uh, one of the biggest hub for artists. We know that by the mid-16th century, there's m- twice as many painters as there are bakers in Antwerp. So it's wow. a very competitive field. And Masai really rises to prominence as a painter of figures, be it religious figures, portraits, and increasingly this type of uh, much more farcical, satirical figures. And so that's that's really much where he thrives. Okay, and who would be the patron for this kind of work? So that's a very a lingering question that I, I did not fully answer because we just do not have documents testifying to the commission of these two works. However, there's a body of circumstantial evidence that some how connects it to a world of humanism and I think it's intended for a humanistic milieu hence also the design of this exhibition trying to recreate a kind of studiolo cabinet atmosphere but there's an anecdote that circulates quite a lot in the humanistic milieu of the time that tells us of the death of the classical painter Xerxes who was frequently compared to uh, Renaissance artists they were the new Apelles the new Xerxes and so on. And Xerxes is said to have died beholding the vivid likeness of an old woman he had made, died of laughter. And so I think this is a kind of a reference to that, a playful nod to that anecdote. So if we are in this world of of satire and humanistic satire, I think it fits well that this painting would have been commissioned, I think, by one of these writers and humanists that uh, Masai was consorting with at the time. Okay, well, let's look at the form of the painting then. So describe for us, if you will, what we're looking at. 
So we're looking at this very imposing figure, which uh, takes so much of the picture plane, actually. She is uh, standing behind a parapet and against a green background. And what we see is this woman uh, wearing this very tightly laced dress that really props up her wrinkled cleavage in a way that I think could feel as scandalous to some uh, today as it was when it was first painted. And this is completely brazen. No woman in the 15th or 16th century would show their chest this way. It would always be, have been covered by an undercolor or a linen fichu and so mm -hmm. on. And she's wearing as well on her head a monumental horned headdress which is actually a 15th century piece of headwear worn by aristocratic women. And by the early 16th century, when this work was painted, it had become a kind of ubiquitous uh, shorthand for female vanity. So if you see a woman with a horn headdress in a picture of this date, she's bad. She's right. <laughs> immoral. So that's it's so beautifully described, isn't it? It's fantastically described. And that's the whole point of this painting, essentially. It's an extraordinarily refined depiction of something so indecorous. And I think that in this tension lies the joke. It's a kind of paradoxical praise, a glorification of a subject deemed unworthy, you know. And in that sense, we're so thrilled to be able to conserve this painting prior to the exhibition because it revealed the extent of the detail of the color and the minute execution. And it's really something where I want to encourage visitors to get close and behold her hairy mole. It even has yeah. a, a white hair. She has hair also sprouting out of her ears. Years, the highlights on her breasts, uh, her pimply skin also came back, the ruddiness also of her complexion at a time when what was prized was a very kind of white and fair skin. So it's really, you know, she upturns every convention, everything you're supposed to be, she tramples essentially, which I think is actually very liberating to behold. Right. And her mouth is closed in a way which would suggest that she's toothless, would that be I fair? I think so. I mean, at least that's how I interpret it. Absolutely. And then she's holding a rosebud. Yes, she is. And it's quite droopy already. It's quite sagging. It, it will probably never bloom. And she's holding a rosebud, which she presents to her companion, the old man, as a token of love. Now, in traditional double portraits of the period, when you see a flower, it tends to be a carnation, which is a symbol of engagement and marital fidelity. Roses had much more carnal associations, so she's really going for it, so to speak. And she's... <laughs> offering it to the old man who raises his hand as a gesture uh, that's ambivalent, actually. It's been interpreted as rebuke. It's been interpreted as salutation. I think that's for the viewer to decide. Absolutely. So the pendant is exactly the same format. And there is just a lot less clear satirical content here, isn't Indeed. it? Indeed. If only the pendant had survived, I think we would be all tempted to say this was a straightforward portrait and it might indeed be a likeness. It shows a much more conventional features, nothing uh, out of the ordinary or untypical, so to speak. And he's dressed in a way that's a bit old-fashioned for the time, but not, you know, not completely outlandish in the way she is. So his is much more ambiguous character and I often pondered as to whether it's actually kind of, again, a humanistic inside joke where they put one of their friends or one of their competitors, someone uh -huh. they perhaps didn't like, and paired him up with the uh, old woman. And this has come from a, a private collection. Yes. Is, is that right? We're so thrilled and so grateful to uh, this private collector to allow for this reunion to take place. It's only the second time they're shown together and uh, it really anchored the entire exhibition. And you really do see that you've cleaned the National Gallery's picture yes. when you see the pendants together, don't yes. you? Yes, she really sings. I mean, the white have come back very strikingly. Uh, but I think, in truth, she, she would have always been much ruddier and redder than him and ah. much more vibrant to a degree. But yes, they have different uh, conservation histories and, and they're in different conditions. But the old man is actually wonderfully preserved and full of fantastic details as well. Yeah, so it's beautifully painted, actually. And that's the thing about these, isn't it? I mean, as you, as you pointed out earlier on, the extraordinary care with which Massai has, has actually made this painting. Obviously, the patron would have been somebody of good taste, would have wanted refinement, yes. and yet there is a sort of 
curious paradox in the fact that this satirical subject has been painted in that way, isn't it? Absolutely. And in that sense, it really stands out from uh, other and later depictions of the grotesque. I'm thinking especially in Italy, for instance, uh, Passarotti or Frangipane, where the style kind of echoes the grotesque subject. It's been called a rude style by Francesca Alberti, and I think she's very right in that regard. And here we're, we're in something completely different, where on the contrary, the joke is the lavish care. And there's a commentary on Masai's part on the ability of uh, oil painting and painters and mimetic representation to create very disturbing replications of reality in a way that perhaps writing can't in this kind of always competition that humanists have between painting and writing. Absolutely. And now, it, the painting is known as the Ugly Duchess, but that was not what it was termed no. by Masai. <laughs> no, so she gains this nickname uh, progressively. Sometimes in the 17th century, when the painting goes to France, and there she gains this identification to Margaret, Duchess of Tyrol and Corinthia, a 13th century female ruler who had the audacity of divorcing her husband, claiming financial and political independence, and as such was reviled as the ugliest woman in history. And so that's the kind of tag that this image gets, and she becomes, in French, the ugly duchess. And this is further entrenched when, in the Victorian period, John Tenniel, when he is enlisted to illustrate Lewis Carroll's Alice's Adventure in Wonderland in 1865, borrows the feature of the ugly duchess for the character of the duchess in the book. So a character who's described as very ugly. So that's when the moniker kind of takes hold and later on in the 20s, Lion Feuchtwanger publishes The Ugly Duchess, which is a biography of Margaret of Tyrol and uses the painting as the cover for the book. And it's deemed so scandalous that uh, part of the English book trade removes the flap because it's just too much, too much brass, too much. It's too shocking. Right. So obviously you're setting it in historical context and art historical context here. Are you reclaiming this image a bit as well to try and pull it from that mire of debates about ugliness, for instance, and, and also to, to point out that, that you have just described repeated instances of misogyny, for instance? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's definitely a desire to reclaim it, but also in a Renaissance context as well. You can't shy away from the misogyny. It is there. It is The satire is very much aimed at women who, who act and dress the way they shouldn't, or they're considered not to, to, to do. But I think you miss the point of this kind of Renaissance imagery if you don't place it in a broader strand of iconography at the time, which actually celebrates the power of women that works around inversions, around the carnival. And as viewers, there is a kind of cathartic joy in beholding those rebellious, riotous women who trample societal conventions, gender expectations, and hierarchies. And as viewers, you kind of also partake in the transgression. And I think that's very much how these images operate. They're ambivalent and complicated and they elicit, I think that's Part of the reason that this image endures is that it's deeply irreverent, and I think it was as irreverent in the Renaissance as it is today. It is, there's something liberating in, in looking at the ugly duchess, Absolutely. not care, in a way, <laughs> yeah. for what but, we think. But also, just looking at her next to the pendant, there is a certain magnificence that she has that he Absolutely. doesn't. Absolutely. She has a grandeur. And, you know, I think we laugh at her, but we laugh with her as well, at all the canons of beauties that she she challenges. And in terms of her grandeur, I mean, she's the one who endured. She's the one who achieved fame. He actually fell into oblivion once they were separated, so she won to a degree. <laughs> That's a nice way to end, Emma. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. The Ugly Duchess, Beauty and Satire in the Renaissance is at the National Gallery until the 11th of June. 
And that's it for this episode. You can find us on Twitter at Tan Audio and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. The Week in Art is produced by Amy Dawson, Julia Mahalska and David Clack. And David's also the editor and sound designer. Thanks also to Daniela Hathaway and to our guests, Ben, Julie and Industria and Emma. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye for now. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime.